Where is your home? Well, for some people, that's an easy question to answer because most people have a sticks and bricks house where they live. Some of us are full-time RVers and are more like turtles in that we carry our homes with us. See, we can draw an X on the ground and say, this is my home. Several years ago, I saw a sign in front of an apartment complex that read, if you lived here, you'd be home by now. See, home for some people will always be where they were born and raised. For others, like my wife, who was a preacher's kid, and they moved many different places during that process of growing up, um, home is harder to answer. For some, home is not a place, but a person. You know, that special person to whom you come home. And what about the homeless? Do they call that abandoned car in the woods or the cardboard box under the bridge home? Even Jesus said that uh, the foxes have their dens and the birds have their nests, but that he had no place to lay his head. And as an itinerant preacher, he had no house to call his home. Home is such a basic concept to us that throughout the ages, people have sought to identify God's home. Jacob had a dream one night of a ladder or a staircase with angels ascending and descending between earth and heaven. When he awoke, the place uh, he placed a stone in that spot because he said, Surely this is the doorway to heaven. Moses, while leading the Israelites through the desert, stops long enough to build a tent as a house for God. And within the tent of meeting, he kept the Ark of the Covenant, which literally was the place where God would meet with the priest. And they carried this tabernacle with them for the 40 years that they wandered in the desert, as well as into the promised land. Even on into the uh, time of Israel's second king, King David, after he had retrieved the Ark of the Covenant, it was kept in a tent where the priests performed their duties. And David had a splendid palace built but he was unhappy that the ark, the presence of God on earth, was kept in a tent, and he wanted to build a temple to house the ark and to become a center of worship for all the Jews. Now, it seemed like a noble idea. God, however, forbade David, a man of war, from building a temple of peace to God. So that job of construction went to his son Solomon in our Hebrew scripture reading for today, we kind of get a glimpse of that dedication of the structure of the temple. And we hear of Solomon's doubts as he said, But will God indeed dwell on earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Now today we have many houses built to house God. Temples, cathedrals, synagogues, mosques, and churches of all kinds. But like Solomon, we need to ask if God will live in these structures. Our gospel reading begins with Jesus saying, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Now, that's a different answer to the question of where do you find the home of God? Jesus tells us that he will live and stay inside us. In Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, he writes, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? So now we have the answer of where God lives. He lives within and through his followers. Now, where is our home? See, our God has given us a home. The psalmist calls it the house of the Lord. The poet of Israel is not talking about the temple or the synagogue or the sanctuary. The house of the Lord is a biblical language for our home with God. Wherever and everywhere we experience God's sacred presence, God's mercy and grace, those green pastures and still waters that we are invited to call home and where we may live forever. 
See, there's no shortages in the house of the Lord. It's a place of abundance and beauty. In contrast to the parched places of our lives, it's a place of vibrant and nourishing green grass. In contrast to the endless noise of our daily lives and the frazzled spirits, the house of the Lord is a place of deep, quiet waters where silence carries us to the wellsprings of faith. And in contrast to the futile desperation of endless seeking after the latest thing, the newest, hippest, coolest, whatever, when we are at home with God, we know that our cup is already filled to overflowing. God is our home. And the more we know that, really know that, and believe it in our heart of hearts, the more we will shift from anxiety to assurance, from fear to fullness, from, from getting to gratitude, and our prayer will become thank you. The late Henry Nolan, a Catholic priest and religious teacher, observed that many people live as if we've forgotten our address, and we're living in the wrong place, living in the house of fear instead of the house of the Lord. See, Scripture tells us that this happens to God's people over and over again, that we forget or get confused or are reluctant to move out of the house of fear and into the house of the Lord. It is as if we kept one foot in each, afraid of letting go, not quite faithful enough to let ourselves be scooped up by a love waiting to bring us home. Now, many of us live in this house of fear without even realizing it. In this difficult and challenging time, fear has invaded every part of our lives. We are anxious and nervous. We are afraid of economic decline. We worry about the cost of our children's education, our health care, our retirement. We're afraid of the world, of foreigners, of potential terrorists. We're afraid of people of other faiths, especially Muslims, and we question their motives and their trustworthiness. We are afraid of disease, AIDS, and the West Nile virus, the bird flu, and the next pandemic that may come along. We are afraid of what we know and of what we do not know. We are afraid of change and we're afraid of standing still. Fear shapes our decisions and our choices. Listen to the evening news. Listen to our politicians. And you'll soon learn that fear stalks our nation. And says Timothy Whitaker, a Methodist bishop in Florida, there is nothing more dangerous than a powerful nation that is afraid. Well, God's alternative to this house of fear is what no one calls the house of love, the place where we can think, speak, and act in the ways of God, not in the ways of our fear-filled world. Jesus, our Good Shepherd, offers us this house, even now, in the midst of our anxious fear. In John 15, he says to us, Make your home in me as I make my home in you. In making God our home, we find what Patricia Ferris, a Methodist minister, calls our grateful center. She says, as we unpack the boxes and settle in, we move from the clutches of fear to the liberated joy of gratitude. Now, I've often said that the way we know that you're receiving something from God is that it comes unex uh, unexpectedly completely different from the sources and in expected ways. It's often an experience of that unexpected that the Spirit of God can break into those habits of heart and mind and keep us from knowing that keep us from knowing our grateful center, says Reverend Ferris. She goes on to tell a story about a massive power out outage that plunged the eastern half of the United States into darkness a few years ago. At that time, Jay Reynolds was director of the planetarium outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And this astronomer saw a great opportunity in the pitch black sky. And what could have been a long night of fear became instead a serendipitous, joyous celebration, a time of fellowship and for gratitude, which became apparent that the, when it became apparent that the power outage would last through the night, Dr. Reynolds set up his telescope in the front yard 
and invited his neighbors to come over and to see the marvels of the sky. The deep, deep black of the sky, free of artificial light, revealed the galaxies in plain view. The whole sky was alive. The planet Mars was brilliant, and the Milky Way, too. Says J. Reynolds said, It was a great night to see the stars the way they were meant to be seen. Now, this story reminds me of the story of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson when they went camping. After a relaxing day on the wooded shores of a quiet lake, they had retired to the tent. Sometime in the pre-dawn, Holmes woke Watson and said, Watson, look up and tell me what you see. Watson said, I see a fantastic panorama of countless stars. Holmes said, very good, and what does that tell you? Watson pauses a moment and then says, well, astronomically, it suggests to me that there are billions of other galaxies that have roughly similar stellar population densities, as represented by my view, that potentially trillions of planets may be associated with such a galaxy, and therefore stellar population. Allowing for the similar chemical distribution throughout the cosmos, it may be reasonable we implied that life, and possibly intelligent life, may well fill the universe. Also, as a believer, theologically, it tells me that the vastness of space may be yet another suggestion of the greatness of God, and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, the blackness of the sky and the crispness of the stellar images tells me there is low humidity and stable air, and therefore are most likely to enjoy a beautiful day tomorrow. Why? What does it tell you, Mr. Holmes? Holmes spoke up. It tells me that someone has stolen our tent. Okay, perhaps sometimes we're like Watson. We're so caught up in the vastness of creation that we miss that which is right in front of us. And perhaps that sometimes we're like Holmes so caught up in the immediate concerns that we miss the vastness of God's creation. Perhaps in the darkness of that East Coast blackout, many of the astronomers' neighbors rediscovered their grateful center, grateful for the thoughtfulness and generosity of their neighbor who loved the night sky so very much, gratitude for the Creator who set the stars in their courses <coughs> and gratitude for a night in which to see those stars the way they were meant to be seen. It was a night in the house of the Lord, with the heavens above, the earth below, and neighbors and family members all around. Our home with God is that place where we experience the unearned, unmerited, unwarranted superabundance of God's love, the amazing grace for which our heart's prayer is simply, thank you. The God who creates for us a home, the God whose house has many mansions, the God to whom we sing endless praise and thanksgiving is our eternal dwelling place. Let us dwell in the house of love, the house of the Lord, where we are at home now and forever. How amazing that we are at once home to God and at home in God. In John 14:20, Jesus said, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Thanks be to thee, O God. Thanks forever be unto thee. Amen.